The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, we are going to get started here today. Thank you, first of all, for being on with us today. Before we do get started with the webinar, we just want to um, express our appreciation for you taking some time out of your day to be on this webinar. Uh, we do understand that a lot of people's schedules and day-to-day -day lives have changed and been interrupted uh, during all of this that's going on, so we just hope uh, you find this uh, webinar valuable. All right, so with that, let's get started. We've got a lot of great stuff to cover. Today's webinar is titled NumPaired Storage, Why It Matters. A quick introduction on my side. Um, I'm Tracy, I'm our marketing manager at Energy Toolbase, and then I will pass things over to our speakers. As you might already know, all three of California's IOUs are now officially accepting uh, energy storage net metering or NumPaired storage applications. Um, this permits uh, eligible solar and storage systems to export storage to the grid to receive that full NEM credit. And of course, this is assuming that the battery does charge entirely from solar. We have been covering and following this since the CPUC's decision to approve uh, NEM paired storage in February of last year. And then in December, SE and SDG&E began accepting those applications with PG&E following suit shortly after. Um, we've been pushing updates to our newsroom uh, pretty often, but Kelsa has been the driving force in getting this decision to the finish line. Their NEM paired storage fact sheet, if you've seen it, has really been guiding most of us through this decision and what it means. So throughout this webinar, we are going to be unpacking the mechanics of exactly how NEM paired storage works and show you the value that it can add to both residential and CNI Solar Plus storage projects. We're also going to be going over how we got here and the policy history of it all, along with some case studies and energy tool base. Um, we're, of course, going to be sending out the recording and the slide deck at the end of the webinar, uh, so look out for that email shortly after. The deck is going to have links to everything that we mentioned throughout this webinar, and we will have some time at the end, hopefully, for some Q&A, so please chat them into the chat box, and we will go over them at the end. So we are really excited to have one of the industry's experts on this webinar, Brad Hevner. He is the policy director at Kelsa, is on. We know how busy that team gets over there, so we appreciate them giving us some time. If you are not a Kelsa member, uh, we do strongly encourage you to become one. Uh, their members have access to just a gold mine of resources. They've also been really great um, at staying on top of industry updates during all of this and have been posting daily updates to their COVID-19 resources blog, including webinar, webinars, policy updates, and a ton of other stuff. So check that out. We are big fans and supporters of everyone on that team. Um, we'll have links available to all that at the end of this webinar. Again, like I mentioned, we also have Adam Gerza from the energy tool base side. So with that, I'm going to pass things off to Brad to get us started. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak here. And thanks for uh, bringing folks together under this topic. This has been something I've worked a lot on in recent years. And um, I'm kind of surprised more attention hasn't, hasn't come on it already. And I know that the energy tool base team had sort of keyed in on it early as a, as a big opportunity and, and has been studying that opportunity and getting the message out. And I really appreciate that and, 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 and you uh, doing this webinar today. So I, I'll just tell the story of the background of the new NEM paired storage rules um, and be available to answer questions on the, you know, on, on the tariff side. So back in 2013, uh, Energy Commission put out an update to the RPS eligibility guidebook, which had a slight tweak in the definition of energy storage in what in, in terms of eligibility for RPS, large systems. And, and um, the utilities seized on language there to say storage can never be NEM compatible. That storage is a separate generator, and so it's, it's just not NEM. And for a year and a half, they refused to interconnect any solar plus storage under NEM 2013 and, and 2014. And so this was actually my first job. When I started this job six years ago, this was the first thing on my list is to get storage back in, in action and make it possible to install storage. 
And so we pushed and we pushed and we pushed, and they, they, a decision came out uh, in 2014 in May. Uh, that uh, next slide just shows the cover page there of, of uh, the first non parent storage decision. And it was a compromise. Uh, it, this um, allowed us to, to continue or to go back to installing solar plus storage under NEM, but with pretty strict limits because we wanted to get something going immediately. And so it had to be something that was, that, that, um, was um, tolerable to all parties, even though it, it, the, the PUC basically over, overruled the, the utilities at the time, um, it, it was the easier pathway to do the easier solution. And so we came up with a set of rules that said it has to be AC coupled. Go to the next slide. It, it shows a few of these rules that if it's above 10 kilowatts of storage capacity, you can't do DC coupled. You have to do AC coupled and you have to install a separate meter on the PV. And what they do is they measure the PV output in every billing interval and make sure you're never exporting to the grid more than you're producing. If you're exporting more across the PCC than the solar is generating, then it must be coming from the battery. And it's the battery discharge isn't NEM eligible, so they don't give you NEM credits for that portion. And so, you know, it works. And uh, for the most part, we're not doing that. And even if we do discharge a little bit from the battery, you just don't get NEM credits for that power. Um, so, it, you know, it has been functional. It, the problem is that uh, it requires this extra meter. And you know, there's some cost involved there, but more importantly, there's delay. You just get put on the utility's regular construction schedule, and it's often nine months before they show up to install a meter. And that's obviously extremely disruptive, uh, and the cost is an issue too. And then the lack of DC coupling uh, is a problem because a lot of, of, of designers want DC coupled. Um, this hasn't been on a lot of in the radar of a lot of residential storage installers be, because below 10 kilowatts it doesn't really apply. That they just have this estimation methodology to make sure you're not doing regular arbitrage from the battery. And it's a pretty generous methodology. So uh, unless you're really pushing arbitrage, you don't get caught in it, and that's fine. You don't have to have the additional meter. But as soon as you go above 10K, you have that metering uh, requirement and the no DC couple. So it's been a big problem. And then, and so we started to work on the next round. We go back and fix the rules and, 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 and make it more all-encompassing. Um, if you look at the next slide, we've got um, a picture of the NX Flow product from NextTracker. Next Tracker, fabulous company, Calico member, has this, you know, this design for energy storage. This is a, you know, the ground mount ag, behind the meter ag system. These are flow batteries and, um, and DC coupled. And this was the solution that Next Tracker wanted to push. And they, so they needed to have DC coupled systems allowed. So I worked with their engineers and the PG&E engineers to come up with some certification to prove that everything going into those batteries was coming from solar. And the utilities all along said, hey, if, if all the battery electrons are green electrons, then you can put those on the grid and we'll give you them credit. That's not a problem. That's not a problem because it's ultimately solar power. And we said, great, we can prove to you that they're all green electrons. And that took a year. You know, they were clearly playing us a little bit and slow playing the whole thing. But we had to go through the exercise of working with the PG&E engineers and getting them comfortable with the next tracker architecture and 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 that was ultimately approved and they've been putting some of these uh these systems in the field um but that the utilities then said well you know we went through the process of working with this one company and improving their product but we can't do this all the time no more one-offs we're, no, we're just not going to do any more one-off approvals of a, a specific company's um uh products you, you need to have a standard and then, uh, so we said, okay, we'll head down that road. And the next, look at the next slide, and, and um, we, you know, define the concept of a power control system, a PCS. And this is something that we do already. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is because it's for ITC compliance, right? A lot of the solar plus storage systems that we install are 100% solar charged because that's, it, it, to be sure you're going to get ITC eligibility, we just do that. But it's not certified. It's not proven. We don't have a, you know, an objective standard to, to, to prove that it is solar only charged. And the IRS, frankly, has never been tough about auditing that. 
and um, so the utilities wanted actual actual proof. And you know, so the system is pretty simple. You just monitor the current to and from the grid, and if it, you know if at any point um, you're exporting, it's you know it, it, the battery can be on. If you're importing power, then the battery has to be not discharging. There's just a relay there, a signal that goes from one to the other. Pretty simple system. So, uh, but then you know we can do it, but we need to prove it. So look at the next slide, and we we uh, we we paired up with an, an initiative that was already ongoing to create a new UL standard. And this had been underway for a whole different purpose, which is to avoid main panel upgrades. And this is something developed under NEC that um, has the same kind of control mechanism that if you know, if you install something behind the meter that would otherwise overload the electric panel, but you know, it's not really going to overload the electric panel at any one time, probably. And you can control it and make sure that it, you know, it, you take the extra step and control it and make sure it doesn't overload the panel. So even if everything were on all at once at the same time, it would overload. If you have controls on the system, real-time controls, to make sure that panel is never overloaded, you just shut down the battery discharge if it's otherwise maxed out. Then you don't have to upgrade that panel. You can avoid the panel upgrades and do installs where it's not possible to relocate the panel if you have these system controls. So this is something that has is has since been adopted and it is coming. It you know it takes a while for the code updates to be implemented. Uh, I think mid 2021 we're expecting to see this in California where you can use a power control system to avoid a service panel upgrade. So that's a whole big thing, another topic. But um, you know, big step forward. The same mechanism can be used to prove that your batteries are charged only from solar. It's you know, it's just power controls. And um, and so we broadened this developing UL standard to include this. And it's got two modes. There's the export only, which is solar only charging. The the battery doesn't import from the grid. And the import only mode, which is also possible, where you can charge, go ahead and charge the battery from the grid, but never discharge it to the grid, only discharge it for on-site load. That's known as import only mode, importing to the battery. And so it took a while, you know, to finalize the, the standard, but we did. And that um, then, you know, got gradually incorporated into the NEM tariffs in California that we, you know, we proposed, we, I, CALSA wrote a petition to change the NEM tariffs to incorporate this new UL standard as another option in addition to installing a meter for non paired storage. So looking at the next slide is the very basics of the new rules for NEM paired storage um, that you can export for NEM credits if it's using a certified power control system and, uh, and the, you know, the, the battery is charging only from solar. The, the two options are available. You've got the solar only charge and what we call the no battery discharge, no battery export, no storage exports. And, um, you know, so you can do either one and be non paired storage without the extra meter. We expect that the solar only charging will be by far the more common because of ITC reasons and just, just system usability reasons. But there are some, uh, some products out there that can do a no export, discharge the battery only to follow on site load. Um, and that's, that's possible to do too. But, but thinking here in terms of just no grid charging, um, the, you can then discharge from the battery to the grid and get none credit. So that's kind of an added bonus. We did this for the purpose of avoiding the end jobs, the net generation output meter. But you know, along the way, we realized, hey, if they're letting us discharge from the battery to the grid and get NEM credits, that means we can time our NEM credits, right? According to, and it happened at the same time as we're forced onto TOU. And so if you have your excess generation in the middle of the day and low value off peak hours, you can store that up and discharge in the evening for high value NEM credits every day, you know, and, and so for certain customer types, we expect this to be super valuable. Whereas, and, and you know, Adam's gonna talk all about this, the use cases and customer types where the, the economics are really good for arbitraging and, and using these power control systems to discharge for NEM credit in the evening. Um, so, um, you know, 
the, the, the two benefits that come before that, first off, if you want to do DC coupled systems, you can. And if you want to avoid the NGOM, you can. But then there's also, um, you know, the ability that it's actually improved economics for certain customer types and brings in new customers to the storage world that weren't, uh, weren't previously good candidates for storage. Um, the, the NEM, you can see this in the NEM tariffs for all three IOUs. If you look at the NEM tariff sheet, one of the special conditions at the end is NEM paired storage. For SCE and SDG&E, the language is pretty understandable and straightforward. For PG&E, the language is ridiculously complicated and confusing, but it does ultimately mean the same thing. You can do any of these use cases. Um, so let me know if you need help interpreting that, but it should, you know, it, it is up and running and they, the utilities are ready to accept applications and they have been accepting some applications uh, under these new rules. So then the question is, Who's getting cert who's got certified equipment? Uh, and we uh, have put up a list on our website and kind of expected this to get populated a lot more quickly than it has. Currently, Solar Edge is the only one has, that has successfully been through certification under this standard. Others we know are close. Outback has been through testing. They're very close. Um, Tesla is, is in testing, I believe. And there are others, there are a bunch that have it on the development list. Um, but haven't gone into testing yet. So one thing is they need to hear from you. If, 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 if there's developer interest, the manufacturers will come through and provide products. And you know the, the, the inverter manufacturers all have very, very full plates in, in development of new functionality. And so they'll bump this up if, if they see the customer demand. So um, for, you know, the, the short of it is that for residential systems, that might go a bit above, you know, if you still stay below 10K, you don't need more than 10K for the customer, then fine, you're, you're all set. If you might wanna go above 10K in residential, you should look at this and, and model it out. And um, you probably wanna do it to avoid the end in many ways, but you can actually target customers with the economics um, for above 10K. And then for, for commercial customers, um, I think we're looking at, at very specific types of customers where this really, helps out a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, we expect those inverters to be certified at some point in the not too distant future. Um, but in the meantime, you, you do have some, some other options um, for products to use and, and this list will be growing. So that's the basic story. Tracy, back to you and Adam. Happy to answer questions. All right, Adam, I'll pass it to you, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end, Brad. Sounds like a plan. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Brad. Let me share my screen. Okay, yeah, great summary, Brad. Um, really appreciate you having, um, you being on, and I think the industry should all be grateful to you and CALSA on this issue. Um, you know, I think it's probably safe to say that, you know, energy storage net metering in California may not exist without uh, CALSA's efforts over the last couple of years on this. All right, so in my section of the presentation today, I'm really gonna focus on showing you the mechanics of how this works in action um, and illustrate the value that it brings. And I've, on my screen right here, got an article up that we just published last week where it's kind of an extension of what we're talking about here, but just really showing um, in charts and graphs like what impaired storage means and how much additional value it can unlock. Um, and I'm going to run through three quick case studies here. And the first one is going to be my house um, in the SoCal Edison Service Territory. Uh, and it's actually going to be based on all of these same assumptions that were documented in this article on our blog. And also just kind of a quick shout out to uh, Solar Power World who also syndicated this article, which we're really grateful for. So hopefully this topic is um, is getting out far and wide and people are getting educated on this. All right, let me jump into my case studies. Uh, I've got a few set up already. Again, we're gonna start with a run on my house. And what we're, before I dive into this, what we're really comparing here for all three of these case studies is what the economics and savings of storage is um, without being able to export to grid, right? Solar plus storage system, but you cannot export. 
versus a solar plus storage system, everything else equal um, in effectively NEM paired storage mode where the storage is permitted to export back and just kind of showing what that differential and savings looks like. So for my house here, let me jump right into kind of step five. I'll give you a little context um, for the assumptions I set up here. Uh, again, it's documented in the article, but I'm using about 13,000 kilowatt hours annually. I sized up an eight KW DC rated solar system. And on the storage system side, I just kind of chose a generic uh, five KW, 10 KWH uh, battery. Okay, so we're really, we're setting and enabling energy storage net metering is really effectively in this box right here, this, uh, this radio button. Um, basically, you can run storage dispatch simulations in energy tool base, preventing uh, or restricting energy storage exports to grid or allowing it. And that's again, really what we're comparing here. So let's kind of start with the case where we are um, frankly, um, preventing or restricting exports to grid. And I'm going to jump right into a visualization screen. And I think this will become very clear here. So let's just kind of take a couple layers off the chart. Uh, again, this is my house. Uh, this happens to be June, July data. And it is going to kind of jump out at you here this um, early in the month. I've got, just got this big hole uh, about eight or nine days where I have no usage. Uh, I was gone on vacation, it looks like. Um, so let's look at what happens on those days with our solar uh, and storage system and not being able to export to grid. So we'll put some layers on the chart here. And let me just zoom in to about a week. Um, keying in on the bottom of the screen, just to kind of give further context, um, I ran this on the SoCal Edison TOUD prime rate. Um, we've actually published a lot of content on this rate in the past. It's a, an incredibly advantageous rate for energy storage economics. And the reason why is because there's a really wide price differential between the on-peak and the off-peak period year round. Um, literally 365 days of the year, um, there's, a, there's a viable opportunity. And you can see here on this particular day in June, uh, the on-peak rate for the TOUD prime, which by the way is 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., uh, 39 cents a kilowatt hour, off-peak rate about 13 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So what's that? Call it maybe about a 25, 26 cent differential. Okay, so we have a strong price signal here, right? To, um, to, to do arbitrage, to cycle the battery and discharge on peak and charge it up off peak. But looking at these seven or eight days on the screen right here, you can see what happens is we're not, we're simply not cycling much at all. And that's a result of the fact that I have no load. Um, when I'm gone on vacation those seven days. So really the battery gets restricted and you can see actually on the, on the top, um, our state of charge uh, effectively goes from 100% state of charge down to about 95%. Um, so really we're kind of sitting on our hands for these seven or eight days. We have this good price signal, we have a good opportunity, but we're not able to go after it. So let me just jump over to another tab where everything else equal, okay, um, but now we have the ability to export storage to grid. And let's just kind of zoom in on those same seven days. And it's pretty readily apparent what's happening here. You know, we are again charging entirely from solar in the off peak period um, and basically filling the battery at 13.6 cent energy. And once we get into that four to nine window, it, it's pretty clear what we're doing. We are, we're dumping it. We're, we're fully cycling from that full state of charge to, a, to an empty battery. And you can even see the light blue line. We are effectively exporting to grid. Now, I don't want you to kind of look at this and think, okay, well, great, this, is, this, is, this adds value when the customer's not home or on a vacation um, you know, scenario. It, it absolutely um, can add value in lots of other cases. Let me show you one other day. This was actually a really interesting day. It was the first day of this billing cycle. So let me try just zooming in on literally one day of the billing cycle. Uh, again, you can see the four to nine window, right? And you can see my usage here on June 19th. I, I kind of came home late and I started ramping at 7.30 or eight, right at the end of that on peak period. Okay, so let's just kind of overlay our layers again here. And again, the battery on that day it was able to discharge a bit because it saw some load and it was able to um, you know, discharge in the on-peak period, but it just really wasn't able to, um, 
cycle very fully. Uh, you can see here in red, I got down to about a 66% state of charge. So about a third of the battery on that particular day. And again, if we were to zoom in on that same day and then impaired storage setting, you already know what's gonna happen. We're just, uh, we are gonna fully capture that um, and, and you know take advantage of that lucrative price signal. So let's just look at a chart here before I jump into some of these other examples. Um, summarizing one year of results. Again, this was for my house um, based on real usage data that I pulled from uh, the SCE site. Uh, and you can see just on a percentage basis, everything else equal. We got the same equipment, the same solar system, same storage system, um, but by effectively enabling exports to grid and, and allowing you know, the battery to kind of really capture value when a strong price signal exists, we're, we're getting about 28% more savings on an annual basis. Uh, and you can also see, obviously, it's cycling more. So that was the article, or I'm sorry, that was the uh, the case study that was documented in the article. Um, I want to move over now to a couple of non-residential um, runs where things get really, really interesting. So let me kind of just go forward a slide. Okay, so uh, on the commercial side, uh, there's a couple extra layers of complexity that you have to think through when you're, you know, comparing how much additional value you can capture from, from an impaired storage. Okay, so for this first run here, we're going to look at a church in the Southern California Edison Service Territory, and I need to do this to begin with. We need to talk about rate switching. Um, I think for all of the developers and, and sales folks that are on the line that are commercial developers in California, they, they know this concept very well. Um, basically, it's very oftentimes in your best interest and in your customer's best interest um, for not only just a, for a solar plus storage project and even oftentimes a solar only project to rate switch your customer and move them onto a um, quote unquote solar friendly rate post solar and storage. So this is the classic example in the SCE territory. Um, the GS2 TOU option D is the default commercial rate for uh, medium sized commercial customers in SCE. And then the GS2 TOU option E is the quote unquote solar friendly rate. Um, and remember for those old school folks on the line, this used to be the B and the R. Uh, they renamed this. It's now the D and the E. These are the current effective ones in place today. It's pretty simple what's happening here. I know it's kind of, it may, may seem like a lot to make sense of, but on the D rate, right, the, the default rate, it's a pretty high demand charge schedule. Uh, you can see uh, about $11.50 per kW on a non-coincident demand charge. And then in the, in the summer, they really tag you um, coming in at $30 per kW on peak demand. And then on the energy side, I would kind of, especially for California standards, call these pretty mild, um, you know, 13 cent per kilowatt hour energy on peak, nine cent off peak in the summer. That's, um, it could be a lot worse, right? And now comparing how the E rate, again, the solar friendly rate compares to the D rate, really all is they're doing is kind of change, the utility is changing how they recapture costs. Um, and they're doing it by really reducing the demand charges uh, you can just kind of see um, compared to the D rate, these are significantly lower, especially that on peak summer uh, demand charge. And then they're making up for it. They're kind of trading off and, 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 you know, via the energy charge where they're really now getting most of their cost recovery um, from energy charges. And you can see there's a really wide differential there in the summer, 52 and a half cent on peak, 12 and a half cent off peak. Okay, I hope I didn't lose you. Now let's pivot over back to the case study um, of the church. And this one is actually really interesting to look at. Um, so here we go, I've, I've already got it set up. We're gonna be doing this rate switch from the D rate to the E rate. Let's jump into step five and just give a little bit of context for the storage system I set up. Um, I'm doing a two hour duration battery, a 75 kW, 150 kWh. Um, one other layer of complexity that I just have to at least make mention of on um, any sort of commercial um, solar plus storage project is um, in commercial settings, you're absolutely stacking and you're capturing savings. You're, you're reducing your utility bill both through demand charge reduction and also through arbitrage. 
Um, and again, like the, the chart on the last slide um, kind of was trying to illustrate that like arbitrage is now a big part of the opportunity, um, you know, because there's that really wide differential. So that's what we're doing here. This initial run for the church, we are not gonna export to grid. I know I'm throwing a lot of setup stuff at you. Hopefully you're following along. Let's um, now unpack kind of what's happening here. Okay, so this is really interesting. This is a church. Again, we're looking at one month of data. You can see there's um, about once a week kind of some uh, some spikes. They're likely running a service there. Uh, this four day period, it looks like they even had kind of even a bigger ramp, maybe some sort of event. Okay, so let's overlay our solar data on the chart and let's overlay our storage dispatch data. And remember, this was a stacking strategy. Uh, this is, we're doing both peak shaving and arbitrage. And the thing to key in on again here is kind of early in the month, right? So let me just maybe zoom in on this week, early in the month, again, looking at the bottom of the screen, this is the DGR rate, and there's this incredibly lucrative price signal the on-peak rate, that is not a typo, it's 52 and a half cents a kilowatt hour on-peak. Again, that's four to nine, 12.7 cents off-peak. So um, a really big opportunity here to cycle the battery fully if we can uh, and capture that arbitrage opportunity. But once again, we can't. Um, we're really, um, frankly, pretty restricted here um, simply because this church um, for this I guess five or six day period on the on the screen here, doesn't have enough load four to nine. I guess this day is a good example where there is some load, right? And we're taking advantage of that, but there's just not enough to fully cycle that, you know, what, 75 kW, 150 kW, 150 kilowatt hour battery. Um, so basically we're getting our demand savings, but we're not capturing the full value of that arbitrage opportunity. Okay. Uh, take a mental note of that and let's just compare that against this run here where everything else is identical except for the fact that you know we are permitting storage to export to grid and you probably already know what this chart's going to look like we're still going out and getting our demand savings very similar to the way we were before um, frankly that piece of the equation doesn't change um, what does change is um, the arbitrage opportunity where, again, this looks very similar to the house example where we are um, we are fully cycling and you can even see that 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 export to grid and um, capturing that really lucrative arbitrage opportunity here. And, you know, certainly there are still some days, actually, if you fast forward just to kind of, you know, not make everything look really rosy, um, the June 12th and June 13th day, you can see were pretty bad solar days and the battery wasn't even able to fully charge itself on those days because there simply wasn't enough um, solar production. Um, but again, um, as I hope most of you already know, the way we run things in Energy Toolbase is just running this over a 365 day simulation. And let me maybe now put up this on the screen, which is just kind of counting up and comparing um, what sort of savings we, we were able to achieve um, in NEM paired storage mode enabling exports to grid. You can see on a percentage basis here, we're maybe 19, 20% better off. Um, so that's just another example. Again, the church here um, doesn't have a lot of 4 to 9 p.m. load, which is um, helping to enable uh, this effect. Okay, I've got time for one more. Uh, let's look at a school. I'm gonna jump over to the SDG&E territory. And I know I'm throwing a lot at you here in Q&A. Hopefully um, you're chatting over questions through Tracy and um, I can address any of those there in the Q&A. Um, let's look at the very classic rate switch uh, example in sdg &E. This has been the same rate switch uh, that I was doing 10 years ago when I was doing commercial projects down there. And this is the, uh, the ALTOU to DGR switch. Very similar to what we looked at a minute ago on the SCE side, the ALTOU rate is a very high demand charge schedule. Um, oftentimes um, demand charges represent over half of the bill uh, for a lot of ALTOU customers in San Diego and energy charges are less than half the bill. Um, and then the big difference is when you're, or if you're moving your customer to that DGR rate, um, the trade-off again is um, much lower demand charges in exchange for much higher uh, energy charges. Uh, and again, the, the moral of the story here is that arbitrage, time of use energy arbitrage becomes so much a bigger part of the opportunity. Uh, you have to be able to capture that to really extract 
um, full value. So let's look at an example of that for a school. Again, I've got the ALTOU to DGR rate switch set up um, just to give context on the storage side. This one, I'm going to run a four hour duration battery. Um, Brad was talking about um, uh, the next tracker and the flow battery. We are also very much fans of the flow battery, long duration guys. And uh, in fact, I think in a lot of cases, um, um, you know, when you're longer duration, uh, an impaired storage becomes even more important because you have, you frankly, just have more capacity that you need to um, unload. So let's take a look at first um, what it looks like not enabling exports. And this is a really interesting month. I actually just kind of randomly found this. Um, and it's interesting because you can see like literally the school right around June 14th kind of maybe like went to a summer session, right? They were clearly operating one way in this billing cycle. And then um, I, I'm guessing again, this might've been like some sort of, of summer break. Um, and let's just kind of do what we've been doing, which is overlay our layers on the chart. It's really interesting if you think about it. So during the first half of this billing cycle, um, we actually are, you know, without an impaired storage, able to cycle the battery, and we, we are able to kind of discharge and capture that really, and you know, basically sell back at 56 cents a kilowatt hour, um, because there's load there. there. There's customer load for tonight um, in the first half of the billing cycle, but then certainly in the second half, there's not, or there's not as much. Uh, and again, we're really getting restricted uh, by how much we can um, discharge back, and you probably already know what the next tab I'm gonna show you is, uh, it's it's the same screen um, in NEM paired storage mode, and um, you, this is very similar to what I've shown you both in the uh, the church example and also for my house. Um, we are um, when that price signal exists, and if it makes sense for us to, we are absolutely cycling that battery um, fully, which is what we're doing here. And then really quickly, let me jump back. I know I'm jumping all over the place, but I think it's just easier to look at summary table data of what the the comparison effect was, and in this case, we we captured about 22% more savings um, by enabling exports to grid. So, three examples, um, all pretty similar results, right? Where we're we're, we're just capturing more um, by having that on, and maybe that'll just kind of segue me to my last slide. I'll keep this really short. Um, I kind of already mentioned all these points, but obviously, um, there's lots of examples where it just can unlock additional value. Uh, it, it allows you to use the battery and, and um, reduce the utility bill more uh, by having the flexibility to discharge uh, regardless of customer load. Um, bullet point number two, you're probably already thinking this in your head. It really, where Nampere storage has the most value is for customers that don't have a lot of four to 9 p.m. load, right, in that on-peak period. and. Um, you know, whether it's my house um, or um, both a church and a school um, are, I guess, two examples of facilities, certainly at some points of the year that, that don't have a lot of load there, um, which allows, you know, energy storage net metering to unlock value. I guess what I did not show in a case study, there are cases where having NEM paired storage um, does not necessarily um, create additional savings. If your customer, let's say your homeowner, has a lot of 4 to 9 p.m. load year round, it's kind of a moot point because um, you could discharge the battery and just reduce load. Um, that said, I think I can't think of any scenario where you wouldn't want to have this. Like Brad said, there's actually advantages to kind of having less metering requirements, which seems to me like a good thing, um, less hardware and maybe less cost. Uh, and then also one other thing, I just wanted to make a quick point. It's not in my case studies, but um, you know, critical peak pricing schedules. Um, those are those are becoming more prevalent. Those are you know rate tariffs where you have these event days, where maybe a half dozen times of the year uh, the utility calls an event day on a really extreme weather day, um, and the, the the price signals there are incredibly lucrative. Like sometimes you'll see like a dollar and thirty cents. Uh, per kilowatt hour during that time block uh, when they call an event day. And why wouldn't you want the ability to um, to be able to really fully dump the battery, maybe even reduce load that day and dump the battery to just capture as much as you possibly could for your customer? Again, we're thinking about this from the perspective of like, let's figure out ways to make solar plus storage even more economically viable. 
capture more savings, you know, show a better rate of return. Um, and yeah, bullet point number three, um, you can use our tool very quickly to find out. Uh, there are cases where it probably is not going to add a lot of extra value, and there are cases where it can, and um, you can really set up and uh, and run those um, right through Energy Toolbase. I will give a quick plug. Um, Brad mentioned it in his. Um, uh, right now, there's actually only one vendor that um, is approved, and actually, we do have a, a Solar Edge integration live on the platform. Uh, and this is for the store edge coupled with an LG Resu 10H battery. And I just want to make the aware of this. We absolutely do have uh, the mode of operation where, um, I'm sorry, it's this one here, where you, you can export. Um, so that's kind of neat. Um, we work with the solar edge folks to get that all set up. And th that is set up and you can run that and just kind of see for yourself, just I guess comparing an A versus B case. Um, you can do it or you can't do it and see if it, it saves you anything additionally. Um, and I think that is just about it for me, Tracy. Did I have one last thing and I'll pass it back? Sorry. Yeah, that was it. And then uh, again, link to that article. Tracy, I know you have a slide with a lot of really valuable links. So I will pass it back to you for Q&A. All right. Sounds good. Um, Adam, just let me know if you can see that Q&A screen here. Am I all good on that screen, Adam? Looking I'm gonna... still seeing mine. No, nope, we're good. We are good. All right. Cool. Okay, yeah, we did have quite a few questions. Um, we want to take as many as we can, um, but I'm going to address one. Um, yes, the, the webinar recording and the slides are going to be sent out in an email after the webinar, so just be on the lookout for that. Um, so with that, I'm going to just kind of go through some of the questions we're getting in. Um, I think some of them can be answered by both Brad and Adam, but um, Brad, I'm going to give this one to you. Um, once equipment is approved, can existing operating projects with that equipment, um, but interconnected under the previous rules, use these new rules uh, going forward? I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. We hadn't really thought that that would be very common because once you're in the, the biggest use case is avoiding the end job. And, um, and once you're interconnected, if you've already installed an end job, that's not an issue. You don't need to do it for that reason. But if you're doing it to unlock additional savings, then yes, you absolutely can. No question you'd be able to. I, the thing I'm wondering in my mind is would you need to have a new interconnection application most likely just sort of altering the the interconnection agreement. Um, so I don't know that utilities have a defined process that's going to be straightforward in how to to make that change, but there's no question that it it would be possible to do it. Okay. Utilities haven't seen a lot of these applications, right? And so they they they've said they you know they want to get them get some experience before setting down fast rules and and maybe developing new forms. Um, but they're open to working with us on this. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Adam, this one, maybe you can answer. When can we expect to model the option S tariffs? Coming soon. I got to be vague. We don't have a, a specific date. It is very, we get it. We hear that question a lot. Um, it is very high on the to-do list over here. Um, and the answer is soon, but I do not have a firm date. And the option S for those that are listening, that's that daily demand charge rate that um, is um, going to be really interesting to look at. So that's the best answer I have for now. It, it is coming. Okay. Um, do, uh, do the NEM export rules for storage apply to CCAs in the same way, Brad? I think that one's for you. Yes, they do, because even if, as a CCA customer, your interconnection agreement is still with the IOU. So you're going through the normal IOU interconnection process, and, and the rule will be the same. Okay. Um, someone asked, when does this go into effect? Um, we did mention this, but um, all the uh, IOUs are accepting applications for an impaired storage, so that answers that. Um, Brad, I'm going to give this one to you because we've asked, been asked a couple times, a little off topic, but as we are getting closer to May 1st, um, is there any update on the S-chip application window? 
I don't think there's an update. You'd have to ask Scott, who's way more on top of SGIP for the Kelsa team. Um, but I think, you know, they've taken a month to fix their database, and I haven't heard that they're having problems. So I assume it's all systems go. Okay. Sounds good. Um, let's see. Adam, this one's for you, I think. Um, will the ITC um, apply to storage to grid exports or no? Yeah, the cool thing here is your one, well, don't forget, in impaired storage mode, the, the two key pieces are you can, you can, you are authorized to export energy storage to grid and get an M credit if you charge entirely from solar. So um, the ITC requirement is charging entirely from solar. So you're, you are definitely killing two birds with one stone. You would be charging the system entirely from solar and therefore you'd be getting your, your ITC and you'd um, have this kind of value stream that we're pointing out here. Okay. Um, maybe this one's again for you, Adam. I'm sorry, I feel like they're all interchangeable, but um, are there cases in which the battery can charge by solar and the grid? Yeah, there are. Um, you know, I that was kind of I was thinking about touching on this in here, but uh, I just wanted to stay focused. Um, you, number one, you you would not be able to be eligible for unimpaired storage in the way we're we're showcasing, right? Because you have to charge entirely from solar. But you know, certainly standalone storage, right? Uh, and it's pretty surprising in the S-chip data. I, I was actually pretty surprised by the fact. I think Brad, the number was thirty percent of. Um, non-residential S-chip reservations were um, were not paired with solar, which seems like a big number. And obviously there you're, you know, you're going to be charging from grid, but you would be prevented from exporting. Um, hope that answers that question. Yeah, that's right. And then, you know, for a solar plus storage system, the presumption today is that you're charging both from the grid and from the solar. That That's why the, the non-paired storage rules are a new thing. That even if you're not charging from the grid, the utility assumes that you are, and you're perfectly able to. I mean, it's, it's, it's perfectly allowed to charge from a combination of solar and the grid, but you just don't get NEM credits for exports in that case, and you have to prove that you're not exporting from the battery. Um, so I think with Q&A, uh, we'll stop here with that, um, but, Again, we will reach out to you uh, to help get those questions answered. Um, I do want to say again, thank you to Brad for being on with us. Uh, we appreciate you um, and the whole CALSA team for giving us awesome content and keeping us updated on everything. Um, I know I mentioned this a little earlier, but they've been posting those daily updates to their COVID-19 resources page. Um, so I have the links here for that and everything else we have talked about. One more thing to mention, if you're looking for some more upcoming webinars to attend, we are co-sponsoring another with CALSA on May 7th on designing and selling CNI storage systems. This is a part of their professional development series. It's free for CALSA members. There is a small fee for non-members to register, but this just goes to support their organization and what they do. So we will send that uh, registration link along as with that as well. Um, Again, we covered a lot today, especially Adam's section within ETB. So if you have any interest in um, an energy tool base, uh, please sign up for a free trial um, or hop on one of our weekly demos with us. And quickly, just to mention before we go, we understand like this time has been a struggle for everyone. Um, and we want to say if you have any questions or concerns or anything, please don't hesitate to reach out to our team. Um, we're to we are here to help in any way that we can. So we hope to see you guys all soon. And um, thank you again for being on with us today. And thanks again to Brad. Thank you. Talk to you soon.